Hi, thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad that you did. I appreciate it. I'm twin number three. This video is part two of the second beginning at the start of Genesis, the Garden of Eden story. I left off with a double name of God making a complete person and placing that person in a garden. The name of that person in Hebrew is Ha Adam, which means the human. I'll point out a few things without comment, just for your information. There are a few places too I'll translate a little differently. I think it's more accurate. That's for those of you who want some more detail. For those who want to just follow the main storyline, I'll keep it brief. In chapter 2 verse 7, YHVH Elohim made the human from the dust of the ground. And there's something new here that was not in chapter 1. Deity then blew into the human's nostrils, Nishmat Chayim. This means living souls, and Neshama is higher soul, more like the individual person. It's plural. There is a Kabbalistic teaching that all of us were present in this initial complete person. Not all of us took part in the fall, though. There is an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew. It's called the Septuagint. We can compare the Septuagint with the traditional Hebrew that we have now and get some insight into uh, how the Hebrew was understood a couple thousand years ago. The two differ significantly in this part of Genesis. I will follow the Septuagint version. If you have an English Bible, you can see how the traditional Hebrew goes. If it says God, that's Elohim. If it says Lord, that's YHVH. Lord God is YHVH Elohim. In verse 8, according to the Septuagint, Elohim planted a garden called Eden, which means pleasures, and placed there the human whom he, higher deity, had been forming. And Elohim made trees sprout from the ground, including a tree of the lives, Eitz Ha Chaim, and a tree of the knowing of good and evil. These trees are very important symbols and what they actually are many of us encounter every day. At this point there's a lengthy discussion of four rivers which are also symbols. In making these videos I want to give you information that tells you what the text really says. A lot of people spend a lot of time studying the Bible and arguing about the Bible but Bibles are translations and you'll never get what the text says from the translations. So I want the information to be the best that I can give you. Frankly, I'm not sure that I understand the rivers well enough to even talk about it. So I'm going to skip past that part. If you know something that explains these rivers that you think is pretty good, please send it to me. I'd really appreciate it. So next, YHVH Elohim takes this human and rest the human in the garden to serve it and to protect it. YHVH Elohim says to the human, you can partake of any of the trees you want except a tree of the knowing of good and evil. If you partake of that, then dying you will die. This double death is usually explained as an immediate spiritual death in some way, eventually a physical death. Then YHVH Elohim says, it's not good for the human being apart from himself. I will make a helper opposing him. Now here's a little point. Hebrew words have to be masculine or feminine. And the word helper here is masculine. There is a feminine form of the same word, meaning helper, but it is not used. So if you're a heterosexist and say that God made men to be with women, and that's the natural thing, you have a big problem with this verse. Why didn't it say the feminine form of helper if that was the intent? You have a problem with the next verse too. If God is deciding that it's not good for the man, it's really the human, to be alone, why is the solution for this to make all kinds of animals? 
I mean, from a heterosexist point of view, this is almost laughable, really. Oh, there's a lonely guy. Let's get him a bunch of pets. According to the oral tradition, the companionship provided by the animals as a cure for the loneliness worked, at least for 100 years. Well, it almost worked. The, the human got along very well with the animals. They all lived in harmony. So none of the animals constituted a helper opposing the human. Please pardon a small aside at this point. It concerns those who argue that heterosexuality is normal or natural and that homosexuality is unnatural. Now you might come up with that from some philosophy somewhere, but you'll not get that from the Bible. Here's an example. Isaiah in chapter 11 talks about the ideal world to come when we have a new heavens and a new earth. You've probably heard some of these verses. I'll go through them very quickly. The wolf will sojourn with the lamb. The leopard will crouch with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling will be united and a youth will drive them. A cow and a bear will feed united and their children will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like an ox. Notice that this ideal world that the highest deity will establish is a very unnatural world. In every case a domesticated animal is paired with a wild animal. In Hebrew these are totally different terms. Not only that but they have children and then the lion is an herbivore something very unnatural in our world. Here's another aside for those who want to do the transformation. You need to know about Sandalfon and Metatron. English Bibles say a little child will lead them. It's not little child, it's Na'ar, which is an adolescent, will drive them. That's a reference to Metatron. So at this point we're not finding much support for heterosexism in the second beginning. So then Elohim caused a deep trance to fall on the human. Then Elohim took from the sides some of the flesh and built this up into a woman. Now it's questionable as to whether it's okay to put a person into a trance and take some of his flesh without his permission. But notice this is being done by Elohim as we had in chapter 1 of Genesis, not by YHVH Elohim. Now remember, there are complete Elohim and fragmented Elohim. Presumably the complete ones brought the animals as companions, and now these are fragmented Elohim who are fragmenting the complete human. Now Genesis 2.24 is the only verse I can think of in the Bible that really provides any support at all for heterosexism. When you've got tens of thousands of verses in a Bible and you have to rely on just one, that's not much to go on. It says, Therefore a man shall forsake his father and his mother, and he shall follow after or cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. But notice something. We have a narrative unfolding, and this verse is not narrative, it's commentary. Be very suspicious in the Bible whenever the story is unfolding as a narrative, and suddenly you have a commentary placed in it. It's very likely that commentary is a scribal edition, not part of the original text. And in fact, that's the case here. If you saw my channel intro videos, you know there's a way to detect scribal inserts into the book of Genesis. This is an insert. So of the thousands of verses in the Bible, heterosexists don't have a leg to stand on. They don't even have a toe to stand on. It's more like they're standing on a hair and they don't even have that. Throughout the entire Bible it's the pathetic, fragmented, fallen, male and female Elohim who are opponents of higher deity and of the transformation. From a biblical perspective heterosexism is the disease, the cure is higher deity becoming complete, and those people who want to bring the big change, the transformation. Thanks so much for listening. Blessed be, be blessed.